together before your before you and your word as we look at the book of Hebrews and we go through and look at the tonight the the, the, the wonderful complete totalness um, the propitiation uh, that Jesus Christ was that his one sacrifice of himself could do something that the blood of bulls and goats could never do uh, and that is have, uh, offer eternal redemption and forgiveness to anybody that will simply believe. Uh, we do thank you for that, for that plan, and that it's predicated uh, both for us and for Israel um, on what Christ has done, not what not what we have done. And again, we give you thanks in all things in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's pick it up in Hebrews chapter nine. Chapter 9, I guess, in verse, uh, verse, oh man, verse 9, verse 8, the Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances, imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, being come and a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats... And the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth through the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law with, purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered in the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should suffer all. Uh, should offer himself often as the high priest entereth in the holy place every year with the blood of uh, with blood of others for then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself and as it appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment so christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation so i think we we finished up last time talking about the uh, the blood of bulls and goats and the, the ashes of a heifer and we saw that those were that, that was that ceremonial cleaning but that really couldn't purge you of the of the remembrance of your sin right if anything it would make you more conscious of it because i'm why am i doing this well because i sinned and then you'd go out and you'd have to start start doing it again and then thinking thinking those things through again and then he, in verse 14 he says you know but but how much more shall the blood of christ Purge your conscience from dead works to serve to serve the living God. See, and I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this verse and, and, and what he's talking about, because he's not talking about saving the people from hell in the verse. He's talking about the, the blood that he shed, purge them from dead works. What's the exact phrase there? From, uh, from dead works to serve the living God. See, when they were doing those the, 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 those dead works, when they were trying to do the, the works of the flesh, the deeds of the law, they weren't serving God. Which is very interesting. 
when you think about what they were doing, and you got to go back and think the the Pharisees and even Paul, for for that matter, they were all what very zealous, but without knowledge. Look over, uh, keep your hand here, and while we're thinking about it, look over at Rom, Romans um, Romans ten. Romans 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them and, and then he goes he goes on there but because jesus christ shed his his blood they can now be purged from those from those those dead works as it's called and go on and begin to serve the living god because they don't they, they're not constantly on that religious treadmill they can just trust that that's the messiah that they know that their sins are going to be forgiven and then they can go on about with the kingdom business seeking seeking first the kingdom of god as they're supposed to so we need to remember, you know, just like grace doesn't just save people, it's also how we learn. It's also how we're supposed to live our life. It's also how our life gets gets uh, renewed, and it's 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 a way that God wants us to live today. Uh, in, in like manner, this issue of of living unto God is is the the same issue. You can't do it if you're focused on your flesh. If you're focused on what can, you know, what can I do for God? What was the old that? What was what was what has Brown done for you lately? If your question is always what what have I done for God lately, or look at me, God, or look at me, you need to be done with that and focus on what Christ has done, because as we just read, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So if they're going about to establish their own righteousness, they do have that zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And what? Then they end up not serving the living God, and. As we all know, there are millions of people out there. We were, we were just talking about the issue of knowledge that have great Bible knowledge. Maybe I mean they, they know then they know where they can find things in the Bible and quote a lot of verses, but it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't work in them because they believe it. They believe what the words that the words say that, but they don't know how to how to. They haven't allowed it to to renew their mind because they're still approaching it with their own attitudes then it's the same thing that, that he's talking about he says look you don't need to be wrapped up with that stuff anymore because christ has already died christ has died for you so you can purge your conscience purge it from those dead works quit feeling guilty quit worrying about that stuff and get on with serving the living god now for them in the in the context here it's going to be that issue of seek ye first the kingdom of god right because they're in that tribulation they're going to be need to be working taking out taking out the gospel to Jerusalem and Judah and Samaria and then to the outer parts of the earth following essentially what's going to be that the 144,000 there. So he comes to 15 and talks about, well, for this cause, what cause? To purge their conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. He's the mediator of the New Testament. Now we've looked at the New Testament. You know, that's really over there in chapter 8, uh, verse you know, basically eight to the end of the chapter, where he's going to write their law, write his law in their mind and write it in their hearts. And he'll be to them a God. They shall be to him a people. They're not going to have to teach their neighbors anymore. They're just going to be able to get along, get on with the business. Okay. He is the, verse 15, for he is the cause, this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So we looked at this last time in relationship to 325 when he talks about the sins that are past. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. Now, again, we're talking about Israel here. We're not talking about the church body of Christ. He died on that cross in order that God, could, for the Father, could forgive all of those sins that had happened since Adam to that moment. They were all, that whole, God was able to, to be long-suffering and forbearing with those people 
because he knew the events of the cross were coming. And it's on it's on that fact, on the, the basis of what happened at the cross, that God was able to re, redeem those transgressions or forgive those transgressions that were under the First Testament. Now you don't, hey, good evening. Hey, hey, hey. Come on in, how are you? What do you say? Yay. What are we studying? We're studying Hebrews. Hebrews, cool. Go ahead. I don't know that. I have a Oh, okay. So, we're in Hebrews 9 and verse 15. For the redemption of the transgressions were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Now the called in the context here, of course, is, is the little flock. Okay? He died, he purged their 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 conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. He there have been the redemption of the transgressions that were under that first testament, under the law, that they might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. What's the promise of eternal inheritance, by the way? Yeah, it's it's actually in the phrase. If you're going to have an eternal inheritance, don't you have to live forever? Live forever with God in heaven. Right. Well, no, not not these people. These people will live on on earth. This is Hebrews. Yeah, this is yeah, Hebrews. This is King. Right. But you see, it's eternal. So in, in in that is the issue that well, if you're going to have an eternal inheritance, if you're going to receive the promise of eternal eternal inheritance. If the inheritance is eternal, and there's a promise of that, doesn't that mean that there has to be a promise to you to live eternally? Yeah. Okay. Now, but we all know people die. They've been told they're going to be martyred. So in that, isn't that also then the issue of resurrection? The exact same thing that Abraham understood when he went up to offer his son. He told, he told the guys that were with him, me and the boy, we're coming back. Abraham wasn't expecting that resurrection of his boy to be in the future. He was expecting it to be right then and there, if it happened. So that's what they're talking about. So in verse 16, then he goes on, and talking about this issue of his death, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Right? For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all, while the testator liveth the the old the, the new covenant can't be put into effect until the testator for the new covenant who is christ until he dies right and that that's the way that's the way a testament works or what your final will and testament it becomes good when when does it when does that activate after, after you die right right so with that in mind, I just want to go look at something that we talk about a lot, but maybe sometimes we don't actually think about. Come with me, if you would. We're going to look at all four gospel accounts to Matthew 27. And we just learned in Hebrews that the New Covenant, the New Testament, can't be enforced until the testator dies. So we're going to go Matthew, and then Mark, then Luke, then John. So Matthew 27. Matthew 27 and verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent and tamed from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent and so on. What I want you to see, it's Matthew 27, 50, where the Lord Jesus Christ dies. Come with me to Mark 15. Mark 15 and verse 37. And Jesus cried with a loud voice, gave up the ghost, the veil of the temple is rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Come over to Luke 23.
verse 46. Luke 23, 46. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, said thus he gave up the ghost. And the last one's going to be John 19. John 19. What are you uh, in reference to? What are you trying to prove? What's that? What are you in reference to? When Jesus died. To look at John 19 and verse 33. Uh, this, uh, 32. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. Again, here we are in John 19. It, it, it's something I think we all know and we talk about a lot, but I wanted to ask you to go through and look at it. If a New Testament isn't valid until the testator dies. What does that tell you about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? All except the last chapter of each one and the last two chapters of John are Old Testament books. They have to be. Nobody, nobody ever thinks about that. We, we let that, that editor's page be there as, as if that has some scripture reference to it when Clearly, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Old Testament books. That's Baptism is an Old Testament ordinance. We've looked at that, all the, the, the diverse washings, and we saw it a few verses ago, that happened in the Old Testament. The healings, the uh, devil driving out, that was all in accord with the Old Testament pro program going to that time. When John the Baptist start, is baptizing, nobody comes out and, and asks him, what are you doing? They know exactly what he's doing. And that's why they came out to see it. It wasn't it wasn't something new. My point is, and I, and I understand if somebody says turn to the New Testament book of Mark, don't get all upset. But what I'm what I'm trying to say is when we got come to the Bible to figure out what's to and about us, we better understand that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are actually Old Testament books, except for maybe those last chap chapters. If you want to, if you want you want to do it because they are after, they are after that. That tells you also that the New Testament can't be in force. The New Covenant can't be in force before that time. Okay? Okay, come with me back to Hebrews then. So the question then is, well, what about the, what about the Old Testament? What about the Old Covenant? The Law Covenant? Who died? Who, the, if... If a testament can't be valid until somebody dies, who died it for the Old Testament, for the, the what we call the law? And he addresses that in verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated with blood, without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Come with me back to Exodus 24. So you see what he's talking about. Uh, Exodus 24, verse 1. And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. Uh, verse 3. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words the Lord hath said will we do. Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, rose up early in the morning, and built an altar under the hill, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. Moses took half of the blood, put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. He took the book of the covenant, and read in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said will we do, and be obedient. 
And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. That's what the writer of Hebrews is is, talk, is, is referring to back there. When the, when, the, when the law first got put into place, right? They signed on that con, on that, that dotted line and said, All that the Lord has said we will do. Moses brings it back down, gives them one more opportunity. And they say, yep, everything will, and you, you saw it there. I don't know if you noticed, but they put one more word in it. Not only is it all that the Lord has said we will do, it was, and we will obey. And they weren't any better at obeying than we are. We'd like to think maybe we would be a little better, but no. But what did Moses then do? He just sprinkled everything with the blood of a bull and a goat, right? A calf and a goat. Because something had to die in order for that contract, for that testament to be enforced. So he did that. And now we come forward, now we're here to Hebrews. And Hebrews says, so what about the blood of bulls and goats? It can't do it. But there does have to be something. It was a picture of what was to come. So you're back in Hebrews. So that that, uh, that whole history, that, that, that whole Old Testament, Old Covenant, the law program was all based on the blood of was all was put into place dedicated by the blood of bulls and goats which he's just told us the blood of bulls and goats wasn't what was going to do it it was have to be the blood of the messiah so he says there in verse 22 and almost all things are by the law purged with blood without shedding of blood is no remission now that's a quote of several places the prominent one is leviticus 17 11 there where, where moses says it but he says it's interesting to me too that he says almost all things are by the law purged without blood there are a couple of things that weren't purged murder and adultery there was no sacrifice for that wouldn't purge it from you the only one blood that would ever purge that would be the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's different from our program because everything in our program has been, we have been forgiven for. Look over at Romans 3 and verse 25. You probably have cause to look at this verse a couple of times. But Romans 3.25 whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be the just and justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Jesus Christ is that propitiation, is that fully satisfying sacrifice is what that word propitiation means. It will cover all sins. The blood of Christ will cover all sins. Look over at Romans 5 and verse 9. Much more than being now what? Justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. This is interesting too because in Hebrews, the people that, that Hebrews has written to, they've already been told several times they need to endure to the end. They need to make it to the end. This verse doesn't say anything about us making it to the end. It just says that because we've been justified by his blood, when we believe Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day, boom, we get justified, we get declared righteous, put in the church of the body of Christ, and it says we shall, we will be saved from the wrath to come. You can count on it. Whatever you want that wrath to be, be it hell for eternity or the tribulation, I take it to be both, we're not going through either one. And you can count on that. Never to lose sight of that. Look at Ephesians 1. Verse 7. Ephesians 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, 
according to the riches of his grace. Look over at verse 13. Uh, chapter 2, verse 13. I'm sorry. Chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You see a pattern here? You see a word that keeps popping up in all these verses? His blood. The issue is Christ's blood. Colossians 1, 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So you've got the writer of Hebrews now is comparing for that little flock going through the tribulation the blood of bulls and goats, what they've been so used to, and they're going to be see over in a temple, the Antichrist declaring himself to be God is going to be offering up the blood of bulls and goats as sacrifices. And the writer of Hebrews saying that that can't do it. But the, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that can do it. That can purge you from all your sins. It can purge you from those dead works that all those people over there are doing to serve the living God. They're not going to be they're going to be doing those sacrifices and they're not going to be serving the living God. They're going to be serving the Antichrist. They're going to be serving Satan when they do that. And that's the, that's what the distinction that he's trying to make is that they need to put their faith in Christ and what Christ did. And understand that Jesus, the man Jesus, was in fact the Messiah. Therefore, he, in fact, he, he was the Son of God. He is God. And he lived that perfect life for them. And he was their Messiah. And they need to change their approach, their, their thinking about who that he is. Um, He talks about, too, if you go back to, to Hebrews. Just be, in, I guess back in, in chapter 22. Never forget, Jesus' death on the cross for both these people going through the tribulation and us here today in the Church of Body of Christ, it wasn't just that he died. It was the manner in which he died. The shedding of his blood, the crucifixion. You know, Paul says that he was obedient obedient to the death, even the death of the cross. You know, if he'd had a chariot accident, that wouldn't be the same. But he willfully went to be that sacrifice for us, to, li to, to willingly lay his blood down. And don't ever, don't ever lose sight of the fact that the issue with his death is the, the, is the blood. Because the blood is where the life is. It's interesting, too, because the Bible talks about the blood is where the life is long before science ever understood that, you know. So, okay, so back in Hebrews 9. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission. You know, as, as I look at that verse, too, another thing. If you think that you that, that, that doing good deeds will get you to heaven... You've missed the point of that verse. If you don't take Jesus' blood, apply it to your situation, you're not going to have the forgiveness. right? If you run around thinking, well, I don't need that because I'm a good enough person, that verse says there is no remission. You have to, you have to understand and, and, and acquiesce yourself, I guess, uh, avail yourself, rather, of the blood. So without shedding blood there is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. Okay, we looked last time, right, and we saw that God gave Moses the instructions, gave him the pattern. Look, this is what it looks like up here in heaven. Now you go down there and you build it. Now I'm going to help you supernaturally, but everything that Moses built was just a pattern of what was in heaven. Okay? That's what he's talking about. So Moses uh, verse 23 it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these those things that Moses made they were purified with the bloods of bulls and goats but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these what's the better sacrifice for the things in the heavenly places and access into the the, the real holy of holies the real holy place if it's better than the blood of bulls and goats. Christ and his blood. Those are the better sacrifices. 
Okay. 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, that into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. So the high priest, he'd go into that holy place made, made with hands every right and 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 do do his job in there and he purify himself and then take the blood and do it do it for the nation as as well but Christ didn't go into that one Christ went into the true one which is the throne room of God as we'll see in a second into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us the thing with that holy place too we read it earlier about the veil being ripped from top to bottom and, and you know the thing that that veil being ripped to did not show us that we now have access to that it showed Israel that God had left the nation because that's where they would go to meet God and if they go in and they could they could and that thing was closed the whole, all, all the time right the high priest went in once a year and once a year he came out and that was it but now the thing split top to bottom because God's left that's a testimony to Israel that God is no longer in their midst. He is his self-exile, as some people will want to call it, into heaven. So I, one of the things I wanted to do, though, is because we see this, if you look at verse 12, he says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having attained eternal redemption for us. Well, the holy place that they're talking about there in verse 12 is the throne room of God that we see here in chapter 24 into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So, a couple things I want to look at on this. Um, Can I say something, Dave? Absolutely. Um, I, I think one thing is really significant about this is that that is God's own blood that was shed on the cross. That's right. Uh, not a man's uh, the blood a person has actually comes from the Father. So, because uh, uh, it was the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, that impregnated Mary, the blood of Christ was actually God's blood that was shed on that cross, which is really significant. God, that's right. God shed His own blood for us, for His own creation. Yeah, divine blood, I guess you could call it. <laughs> I like that. So, um, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly themselves with better sacrifices. For Christ is not entered to the holy place with hands, which are the figures of the true. So the tabernacle that Moses built and all that stuff, we've seen that was a picture of the true one in heaven, right? So I, I want to go back into Matthew, 20, or Matthew 12, and I want to look at something that Christ has to say about this issue in this 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 temple. We'll look at three verses in Matthew 12. And I want to focus on this issue of the figure that is to come. Because throughout the Bible you see you see pictures. So look at Matthew 12. Uh, and verse 6. And this is the Lord talking. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. You see there where Jesus Christ compares himself or, or to the temple? So he's actually better than that temple, greater than the temple. Look over at verse 41. Verse 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a great, greater than Jonas is here. There's a prophet, right? He's better than, he's greater than Jonas. And then verse 42 the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus Christ is greater than the temple. He's greater than Solomon. He's greater than Jonah. The op you see, they're, they're 
in the office of a, the temple would be the office of a priest. Jonah would be the office of a prophet. And Solomon would be what? The office of the king. Jesus Christ is the embodiment. Those are all pictures of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Prophet, priest, and king. Which is interesting because in Israel's program, the king couldn't be the priest. But as we're learning through Hebrews, Jesus Christ came to supplant all that. They were all pictures of what was to come. Just like what Moses saw and built was a picture of what was there. These people that came before tended to be a picture of Christ coming. Now, let's be real careful with that because those were all human. And Jonas had some clear obedience issues. Solomon had some clear issues too, right? So, I mean, when, you, when you're talking about typology, you want to be careful that you don't go, don't go too far with that. But, but the, the Old Testament is so much a type of what that little flock is going to see and understand when they go through the tribulation. We continue to see that, that issue as, as, you know, how many times as we've studied through Hebrews, have we gone back to the Old Testament to, to see the, the picture that the writer of Hebrews is trying to bring forward to them? And a lot of times he'll just do it in a verse and you go back and there's a whole there's a whole accounting back there that you that they're going to need to understand to understand what's being said okay so jesus christ uh, is is the is the real jesus christ is not the picture jesus christ is the real the old, what's that the old testament they had to believe that jesus was the messiah or we believe that he died for our sins. Right. And, and I, and yeah, once Jesus, from Matthew 1 on, that that's would be the point, is that Jesus was their Messiah. Yeah. We believe Jesus is our Savior. Yeah. Yeah. That he died for, th th their belief was, like Zacharias, John the Baptist's daddy said, he came to deliver them from their enemies. He was what Scripture talked about. They needed to tra change their mind for that. You see that in early Acts. Peter makes all those things. You've killed your Messiah. You've killed your Messiah. And what do they say? What must we do? And, and, and things like that. They didn't... They At that point, they did have to believe that, you know, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, but not in the way that we did. Understanding that that was their Messiah that they were killed. Yeah. And, it was, and he was back in heaven in self-exile. And if they would repent and be baptized, the little flock would get formed, and then God would send him back we're talking acts 3 there our belief is that jesus christ died for our sins was buried and resurrected for my personal forgiveness of sins so that i can go to heaven now that's my viewpoint god has a has got a plan he's trying to accomplish right and and, and it just involves involves salvation i don't mean to minimize our salvation but that's really the point we focus on but god's focus is well i got to get these people saved so that i can do something else with them right Okay, but you're right. They're they're both believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, but in two different uh, spheres, two different realms, two different ways. And I want to be very careful that we understand it's the same Jesus, just presented differently to two different groups of people. What's that, Bill? Oh, it's two different perspectives. Right? Yeah, exactly. Two different perspectives. And, and I also want to be careful with that too, because you, you'll hear sometimes grace people will say, well. Well, he's he's not he's not our king. He's Israel's king, and he's not our Messiah. He's Israel's Messiah. Well, on a hyper technicality, yeah, that's true. But Paul identifies him as the king. He is the king. He is the king of the kingdom of heaven. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. And you know, I I don't know how you could ever say, well, yeah, he's 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 the son of God. He died on the cross for my sins, but he's not the Messiah. I, I don't I don't even know how that would work out, right? You, say you know, you couldn't. And again, you know, when somebody comes and says, can you tell me about Jesus the Messiah? Share the gospel. Okay. Okay, the other thing I want to talk about is this issue. Um, catch my time here. He talks about that. Um, how do I want to do this here? In Hebrews 9, you guys go go to Acts. And, and yeah, go to Acts 1. Hebrews 9, 24, it talks about Christ is now has now entered into heaven itself, now to appear in, in the presence of God for us. 
look at Acts 1. Because we want to figure out when did when did that happen? Because it wasn't it wasn't after the cross that the writer of Hebrews is talking about that. Look at Acts one, and verse one. Oh, I'm sorry, we're closed. <laughs> we're closed. <laughs> Acts 1.1 1, 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So after the cross, he, he he's with the the uh, Peter and the, and the bunch for forty days there. Look over at Acts one and verse nine. Okay, P Peter asks, "Are you going to establish the kingdom now?" And he says, "No, you know, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. A couple of days, though, you're going to get the Holy Ghost." In verse nine, and he says, "And we had spoken these things while they beheld. He was taken up, and a cloud received them out of their sight." And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they into Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. This is, this is the account that the writer of Hebrews is talking about when Jesus entered in to the heavenly places. Now there's a significance to this, too. Because you, you see the angels there, they tell them, the same Jesus which is taken up from you in heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He's out on the Mount of Olives, and he goes up from the Mount, from touching the Mount of Olives, and he goes up. Look back at Zechariah 14. So they've seen him go up. He's in. He's entered into the, to the holy place in heaven, God's throne room, which I promise you we're going to look at shortly here. But they were expecting his next return to earth to look just like it did when he left. That's what the angels told them. Why are you staring up? He's coming back in the same manner. Which would make sense because that was a subject of prophecy. Zechariah 14 and verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord shall cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravaged. Half of the city shall go forth into captivity. The residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Verse 3. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. There shall be a great valley. Half of the mountain shall be moved toward the north and half of it toward the south. Now what you see there is just like the apostle saw him leave. This is the exact same way he's going to come back in the day of the Lord. When he's coming back in vengeance... To, to set things back the way they should be. He's going to, you can go, if you, you, you can kind of see his flight plan in the Old Testament there, but but what you see, he's going to come down, he's going to land, if you will. He's going to set foot on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives will split, and then he's going to finish up everything that he's got to do and start his kingdom again. Well, that's what they're expecting. That's the next time the Lord Jesus Christ should come back. Okay, he went up once. He's in the throne room of God. And they're, this, is the, this is what they're expecting. This is the next time anybody's expecting the Lord Jesus Christ to come back. This is what we call the prophesied second coming. But if you would, come with me to Acts 9.
Acts 9, Paul, he's got his arrest warrants. He's going out to bind and bring back the men and women that are of that little flock, the ones that do, like you said, Bill, believe Jesus is the Messiah. And in verse 3, Acts 9, verse 3, as he, that's Paul, journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined, shined round about him a light from heaven. He fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And then it goes on, and, and this is where, where Saul gets, gets saved, becomes the Apostle Paul. What I want you to see here is this was not completely unanticipated. He went up on the Mount of Olives, and what did the angels tell him? He's coming back to the Mount of Olives. They never said he was going to stop anywhere in the middle. Now, I, Jesus didn't come and touch earth here. Paul's on the earth. But this, this, this return, the, the, this intervention, this, this dealing with man again, wasn't what they were expecting. They weren't expecting that to happen until the day of the Lord. Okay? Now, come with me to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to look at another coming of the Lord which has not happened yet, is in the future, but it also is not what we saw in Zechariah, nor what Peter and a group were expecting. See, when those angels told that, that information to Peter and, 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 and the rest, he's, he's expecting that they're going to understand what's been written in Zechariah. They just had 40 days of intense Bible study with the Lord Jesus Christ where he expanded all the scriptures to him. They would have had a great understanding of that. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. This is what we call the rapture chapter. This is talking about when Jesus comes back to receive the church. Verse 14. Verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the clouds, to meet together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so shall we ever be with the Lord wherefore comfort one another with these words now people want that thing in Zechariah that we just read to be the rapture or they want this to be the things in Zechariah in Zechariah where was Jesus geographically going to end up on, on the earth right he was going to physically touch the earth he was going to be on the Mount of Olives this one he's not coming back to the earth He's coming to the heavens, and we're leaving the earth to go up. We'll meet him in the air. We'll him in the air. Mm -hmm. Those are different. So when my what's my point? This stuff's all not prophesied. When we when we're, we're talking about what's happening with Paul, it's not something that's subject to prophecy. The writer of Hebrews he says, "Hey, Jesus Christ, he he's entered into the heavenly places for us." It's another internal evidence that Hebrews was written early. When did, he, when did he go in? Well, he entered in there in Acts 1. After he got done with that 40-day intense Bible study, that's when he went up. Now, when we're talking a lot about the Holy of Holies, let's go look and see what the Holy of Holies looks like, the real one, the most holy place in the heavenly places. You're going to find that in Revelation 4. Okay, you guys are in Revelation 4. I'm gonna, you don't need to go there. I'm just going to read you Ezekiel 128. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so is the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. What I want you to see there is the glory of the Lord looks like a bow, right? A rainbow. All the colors of the... When, when, when God... 
when God manifests himself, he does it in the, with the appearance of a bow. Right? Like, what did he do when he came out of, out of Egypt? Manifested himself, what, as a cloud? As a pillar of fire? Okay, here, when he wants to express his glory, he does it in the appearance of a, of a rainbow. That all and The thing to think about there is not this pastel, washed out thing that, that we look <clears> at now, but just the, the brightness and the brilliance of all the colors of the spectrum. Okay? Now, with that in mind, Revelation 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door in heaven was opened in heaven, and the first voice I heard, which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which me must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. We're in the whole, most holy place, we're in the throne room of God. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was what? A rainbow rain around about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. That's the glory of God on display right there. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And he's going to go on to describe the beasts. What I want you to see is what is it, that, that throne room of God. It starts out with the glory of God being a bow. Now he's sitting on that throne. And it's got all those beautiful stones, the jasper stone, the sardine stone, the emerald. Okay? And then you got the, the, the 24 elders. And they're in white with gold on their head, gold, gold crowns, right? I mean, think about how it must look in there. As the glory of God is being shown, it's bright, and it's bouncing off these guys in white and, and with the gold. But that's not all. Then there's thunderings, and there's lightning, so you're getting these flashes of light, right? And, you know, it's, it's loud. The one that blows me away, though, is verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. You know what the floor of the throne room of God is like? Glass, like crystal. Think about, th just think about what's going on in that room. That bow, the glory of God, is just being reflected every single way. It's almost, it, it probably, not, not almost, it is, it's exponentially getting better the more it bounces off something. Right? It comes out of God or off of God, however you want to describe it. The guys are in white, with their, their gold things, and that's getting reflected. It's got a sea of crystal, sea of glass like crystal for a floor, reflecting that back, right? I mean, the light in this room, right? It hits this dark carpet and it kind of stays there, right? Think about if we had a mirror back there. And I thought I was, I was driving today and it was cloudy, but the, the, it was pouring, but the sun was coming right through. There must have been a hole in the cloud behind me because it kept bouncing off the, the road signs right in my eye. And I'm thinking, it's pouring. And I got you know, in this, but and I was thinking about this going. That must be what it's like when that, that that glory of God bounces off something and then right back. Can you imagine how intense and incredible that's going to be? Well, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good answer, Bill. I'm just going to believe it. You just got to believe it exactly. When he talks about Jesus being in 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 that place in the whole not in not. Christ has not entered into the holy places with my hands, but in the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, that's where he is right now. Now in the context, he's talking about the little flock, that the us there is the little flock, it's not the church of the body of Christ, but we will be in heaven someday as well. And it will be a glorious time. It will be a glorious time. Um... Man. Look at verse 25. Uh, uh, Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. So the, the, the reason he brought that up is, is don't forget, 
the writer of Hebrews is talking about the shed blood of Christ. He shed his blood, therefore he can enter into that holy place, the most holy. Now, and he's, he's, he's appearing in the presence of God for us, for the little flock, for a purpose, though. Verse 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enter into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He, he's that, we don't have time to get into it tonight, I probably shouldn't have started, so we're going to stop here. But, but there's a reason that he's sitting at the right hand of God. Yes, he's waiting to make his enemies his footstool, but, but as, he's, as they're going through the tribulation, he is sitting sitting on the right hand of God in the throne room of God in the most holy place. Why? For his people. He's making up making intercession for his people. Now, and it's it's not the high priest has to go in every year and do it. Every year go into the go into the holy of holies and do what he had to do. And then next year he had to do it. Either. And then next year, and then they had to have a bunch of a bunch of priests, right? Because they would, some of them would die, and it'd be a new guy the next year. Not Christ. He did it once. Look at verse twenty-six. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin? How? By the sacrifice of himself. The whole context here of chapter nine is the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus Christ made for the little flock. Now, yes, it applies to us, but the Book of Hebrews is, is about the little flock. Better sacrifice, better sacrifices, his blood versus the blood of bulls and goats. He goes willingly. The animal didn't know. And now he's not entered into that that holy of holies that the <clears throat> high priest did once a year. He's entered into the heavenly places and he only had to do it one time. Because his blood was in fact enough. I mean, th think about that. You talked about, about God's blood earlier. That blood was enough, not just to cover my sins, but everybody's sins. There, there's what's the song? There's power in the blood. You know, if it wouldn't work this way, so bear with me. But if one of us shed our blood for our own for our sins, it would only work for us, at, and, it, and it wouldn't, right? But but there'd be no way to take that and apply it to everybody that's ever been. That's billions of people, potentially. <clears throat> Potentially, they, you, you got to believe. Um, so n next week, I want to look at. I want to take a look at, at these things to finish a chapter, as I've been <laughs> saying we've been, been doing this issue of of offering himself, the suffering that he went through, and the glory that shall come. And then there's also an issue we see here at the end of the of the chapter about judgment. It's very interesting. The whole chapter. Is about Christ dying for the sins, and you get down to the last thing. It says, "But there's a reason people don't want to die, because there's a judgment coming." So if, if you know, it, it, even though the, the chat the chapter is about His sacrifice, if you reject that sacrifice in either program, our program or Israel's program, there's a judgment coming, and that's why people are scared to death. That's why when it talks about the eternal judgment. Um, when it says eternal, people don't really get that. No, you know, we, we, when when you've had a million of the worst days you could ever have in a row, you're just getting started. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about that. And you're exactly right. People don't appreciate that. You, you know, you hear people, well. If that's if God is, does such and such or He allows such and such, I don't want to be in heaven anyhow. You're gonna rue those days you said those words. Uh -huh. You know. So many people that are His God is love. God is love. He is absolutely. That's right. But He's a just God, and He's gonna rain down in judgment. That's right. Uh -huh. That's right. We read the verse earlier. He is just and the justifier of Him. And I don't want to be in that. Oh, Absolutely God. not. You know, we get to go to the judgment seat of Christ and and stand before God in what Christ did in us. Or we can go to the great white throne judgment 
and stand before the one that died for us in our own effort. And my, you know, my wife, she she lit, she left town about one o'clock, and I don't even think I'd want to be held account for the things I've done since one o'clock. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> probably not since I walked in this room. <laughs> You know what's amazing is uh, you were talking about the rainbow and the crystal and yeah. the brightness. The first thing that came to my mind when you were talking about all that is when Moses came down from the mount. Yeah. And, you know, they said that he had this ray and glow about him and his hair had turned white. And, you know, you think all all the brightness, I, I just, that's the first thing I thought about. Yeah was Moses up there in the presence of God when God came as the burning bush and right. he said different things he came to. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, it, I, I just I just can't imagine, it, you know, I, I can, but the reality of heaven and just what it's going to be like is just beyond, oh, beyond yeah. anything. I, you guys have all heard me say this before. It, if we get to heaven and it's what I have in my mind, it's going to be a disappointment to what it really is, mm-hmm. right? Because no matter what I've got in my mind, it's going to be so exponentially better yeah. that if I can get up there and think, well, I'm sure, sure glad it wasn't what I thought it was going to be, uh, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, or when I get to heaven, yeah? Did they say if yeah? When I go, yeah, when I get to heaven, yeah, no, when I get to yeah, when I get to heaven. But if you ever hear those words of preaching when preachers are preaching, mm-hmm. when they say if or but, watch out. That's right. Exactly <laughs> right. I introduced this man here. This is Tommy Miller. Hey, Tommy. This is Bill Farter. Yes, sir. Mr. Tim. How you doing? Bill Farter. Bill O'Lean. I got you mixed up there, Bill. We got two, we got two Tims. That's right. I'm in a good Tim? mood. You no, he's Lee. Tommy. Tommy and yeah. Tim. Tim. Okay. And this is David Stout. That I was able to sit in, you know, it's...